83 degrees under partly sunny skies here on Broadcast Lane in Waterbury. Ten minutes past ten, and you're up to date now. This is Chris Fortier, WATR News. And here we are in the first hour of a Monday Talk of the Town. Mr. Noxon has a few additional days off. We'll be back Thursday morning. In the meantime, this hour, a special tribute to the late, great Jim Senich, WATR in Waterbury legend broadcaster and uh, newspaper man. And uh, we're going to reflect this hour and have some great memories with folks who knew him a very long time, including uh, Mr. Tom Shute, Mr. Arthur Secondo with us today. In the second and third hour, some best of segments. Talk of the town with Mr. Noxon. Same story for tomorrow. We'll be doing some uh, in case you missed them segments on Talk of the Town. And then Wednesday, uh, quite a get. Mr. Joe Markley will be sitting in for Steve between 10 and 1 here on Talk of the Town. So let's kick it off here. Good morning, Mr. Shute. Good morning to you, sir. How's that? <laughs> Good. Good to be here with you and my friend Art Secondo. We go way back in, in Suddenton. We really do, you know. But uh, Jim Senich uh, passed away uh, Thursday, I believe, and a great guy. I'm so uh, happy to note that when we put it on our Facebook page, the WHR Facebook page, uh, uh, a couple of days ago, the comments about him from our audience have been uh, so kind and sincere. He obviously had, uh, in his years here at WATR, uh, built up uh, a lot of love with people who listened to our station and the various jobs he did, which I'll get to in a minute. But I you know, knew Jim uh, when I was 15 years old. I was uh, applying for a job in broadcasting, and he, this is a true story, Art, he heard my tape, but back then you didn't, you didn't see the person you heard the audition tape, and you'd call him in. So he called me in, and, and he says, I walk into the uh, lobby to meet this Tom Shute guy, and he's little, this, this skinny, pimple-faced kid. <laughs> and he said, you're Tom Shute. I, your voice sounds like you're a much older guy. So, but see, he didn't let that sway him. He hired me anyway, $2 an hour, $2 an hour, which at the time was a lot of money. Wow. <laughs> Now, this is the Southington Station at the time, Southington WNTY, Station, WNTY, which, WNTY, which had only been around for a few years at that point. I got to do afternoon yeah. drive, and, but then, of course, as it was what they call a daytimer, so later on in the year, there was no afternoon. So it would go off at 4 o'clock. So um, I, I was not working much in the winter, but I came back the following spring. I ro- rode my bicycle from home uh, to the radio station. Loved being on the air, loved working with Jim as a matter of fact, we, uh, we became very, very good friends. I knew all of his kids. as They were little kids. I think there were still a few more to come along the way. And uh, the whole family, uh, just a gr- great bunch of folks. And, and you know, uh, the, whole, the whole experience was great. So we stayed friends for many, many years. So how did he come here to uh, WATR? He had, as you ha- are going to mention, he had done uh, uh, a number of different radio stations. I think BIS. I think he went to WBIS for right, a time. Right, yeah. And he had done other radio stations, but there was a point where he was out of radio and doing newspaper, and we had an opportunity to uh, to bring him here to Waterbury. So it, so he gave me my first job, and I gave him the job here at WATR. And for us, he did talk. Uh, he did news. He was news director. He did sports broadcasts, which, of course, he loved to do. And we just had uh, – we gave him all these different things to do, and whatever he did, people loved it. He just had that energy, uh, that positivity, and uh, that that great a certain sound that Jim Senich had on the air. That sure. Uh, we were listening to one of his uh, old interviews the other day, and I thought that, that great energy and positivity and interest was always – if you called and said, I'm downtown at the store, he would show you the same interest that he would if you were Phil Rizzuto. Yeah. Wow. So, so that was a huge. I mean, you want to talk about a foot in the door? You're a kid, and you ride your bike to the radio station. Oh, you right. present him this tape. They give you a gig. I mean, that you're off and running, and you're a teenager yeah. with really no broadcasting experience. You just had this natural ability. Well, I went to broadcasting school before that. Yeah. Oh, before that. Yeah. Oh, oh. So well, and, I didn't but, realize but he liked it was before me. that. Yeah, yeah. So I, he put me on the air, and that's how it all began. Yeah. So, wow. And then I was able to like return a favor to him years later here at uh, uh, WATR. And so um, people just loved every job we gave him as programming you know, changed around. They loved him, obviously, and they remember him. There are so many. This weekend was incredible to see so many comments on Facebook and in social media from former players and coaches yeah. and folks that you didn't think in that moment in a play-by-play, if they're playing basketball or if it was a football game, they remember how it felt 
and their families remembered how it felt that they had become superstars because ATR was doing the play-by-play, and this cheerleader, Jim Senich, made them into celebrities, and, and, and it was such a big deal. Did you know about the Jim Senich asparagus place? Uh, no, let's talk about I that. we had that. It must be here someplace. <laughs> we got to laughing one night uh, about something and at some point in his career, and we, be- we came up with a, gym, a-, a fake restaurant called the Jim Senich Asparagus Place, mm-hmm. and I did commercials for it, and we had the Jim Senich Asparagus Place commercials on the air, and we <laughs> had the whole fake restaurant thing going on for quite some time. People be- believe it only served asparagus. That's why it was called the Jim Senich Asparagus Place, and he went along with it, <laughs> and <laughs> he had an all, as- all asparagus menu. And we did it for quite some It's somewhere here in the building. I've uh, got to find it. Yeah. Not the asparagus. The, uh, the, the, aspa- the restaurant. The old uh, <laughs> Jim Sennett asparagus place. Yeah. So, Art, around that same time that Tom is uh, off and running, early 70s? Early 70s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you're up there. 60s, you met Jim. You're on the air. 60s for me. Yeah, yeah late 60s. Yeah. It, uh, it, NTY goes on the air in the fall of 69. And I think Jim was there from the beginning. I believe. I, I or believe so. Close yes. to it. Yeah. Yes. yes. So you meet him. You you at that point are sports editor, editor of the old Southington News Weekly newspaper, and you make this connection. Did you know him before you met no, him at the he, radio station? He sought me out. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, you, you guys don't need anybody else on this show. No, stop it. You stop two it. guys <laughs> talking. I'm going to take my headset off and go home. No, no. I mean, just traveling to Waterbury for me is that's a big. Deal. I know, you got here safe and sound. Yeah. And I never I saw, leave Sunday. I saw parts of Waterbury that maybe I won't see again. That's fine. But anyhow, uh, we were thrilled when Southerton got a radio station. It wasn't glamorous back in those days, mm-hmm. especially when they had the opening ceremonies at the station, and we had the town manager there and yeah. some different people, uh, the leader of the chamber, whoever it was back then. It wasn't me. But it was a big deal. But we have to point out, guys, that... Uh, radio, especially AM radio, was not a big deal. And uh, if you were a so-called celebrity, that meant you walked into a drugstore and somebody recognized you. Mm. That was it. And Jim Senich was the kind of guy that you just liked him from the beginning. I have always said Jim Senich, if he didn't pay his taxes for 20 years, <laughs> nobody would even put him in jail. <laughs> I mean, that's how nice he was. And I think the thing about Jim, when he came to Southington, he realized this was a special place that he knew sports would be a comfortable place to, to, to live and to talk about because Southington was different. And Jim never wanted any more. He enjoyed meeting John Fontana, hearing the stories about Joe Fontana, and he sought me out because he wanted a lot of this background. And I gave it to him, and we became good friends. We, it wasn't a great combination. It was like oil and water, but we were friendly. He, he loved it. Oh, he, You figure, if you start off, uh, and Southington was and is a huge sports town, and the coaches at that time, I mean, that's the Mount Rushmore, and, you know, you come in, and you're this new entity, the radio station, and you want to meet these guys, and it's it can be overwhelming. You know, Joe Fontana, John Fontana, uh, uh, Dom D'Angelo. And, All those guys. And, and, you know, Chris, I was rough around the edges. I wasn't, uh, you know, I put a microphone in my face. I wasn't used to that. And, and Jim would laugh a lot of times instead of sh- trying to straighten me out. He would laugh because I think he enjoyed it. <laughs> I've got a few stories here this morning I thought were really, really different. And it would make veterans like you and Tom that have been in radio for a long time go, wow, how did Jim put up with this? <laughs> but, uh, you know, First time Jim let me have a sports show on Saturday mornings. It was sports secondo style. Yeah. Man, it sounded scary. What's, <laughs> what's I going to talk about? Jim didn't know what I was going to talk about. But it was like a, a commentary show for 15, 20 minutes. And uh, after three or four weeks of doing the show, Jim, he called me into the into his office. That little thing was no bigger than the men's room. He says, <laughs> me, he says, oh, he said, geez, I, I hate to tell you this. What's, am I all done, Jim? No, 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 you do great. He said, but I have to put a disclaimer on your show. And I said, what is that? He said, that means that. If anybody gets mad and tries to sue us over your comments, then we're not responsible. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've heard of that. Go ahead, Jim. And there it was after my uh, show was closing. He, there's that tape commentary. That 
the opinions uh, expressed by Mr. Secondo do not necessarily reflect those of WNTY. Hey, no problem. <laughs> Jim would laugh at me. He goes, he said, don't worry about that, just the formality. But that, <laughs> that led me to the, the playful Southern uh, game. And uh, at halftime, that's when we had actually had a, uh, a booth to speak on because we were standing, we were doing the, the games on the roof of Southern High's locker room which if you took an extra step, you landed up <laughs> on top of a cheerleader who was walking by. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> we were supposed to have Joe Fontana in a halftime. And Jim said to me, yeah, at halftime we'll have Joe Fontana, the athletic director, and I'm here with Art Secondo. All right, we'll have Joe, right? And I had to hesitate, and I said, well, Jim, I, I just found out that uh, Mr. Fontana won't be our guest. And Jim said, why? Is something wrong? That's why he's a little upset with me because I asked him a few questions this week about I wanted some financial information about the Southern Playful football games. <laughs> and he got really mad and told me to get lost. And I guess he's get back at us or me by not being with us this half time. <laughs> and, and Jim couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> and Jim would say, I remember him saying, ladies and gentlemen, you'll have to put up with us. We're going to kill some time because... Joe Fontana, you know, he, Joe Fontana is a little upset with Art Secondo because Art was really trying to get some information from Joe Fontana that nobody has been able to get for the last 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, I was a little embarrassed over that, but, but so, Jim understood. What 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 did you talk about on the sports show that got you a disclaimer? Or did you just it was was it more local centric or did you just sports in general well, national? I'm not ashamed to admit that I, I was a studious uh, uh, at Southern High. I didn't go to college, and uh, but I was president of the Key Club. We won a national award. I was president of the boys' leadership, so I was doing a lot of things. So oh, really, Jim, know that uh, I love sports. And uh, I played on the first state championship baseball team. In basketball, I had my problems with the head coach, who to even today I say he played favorites. And uh, they say he didn't like Italians, but uh, I didn't believe that. But it was true. <laughs> <laughs> Rest his soul. But anyhow, yes, yes. I was the kind of, that's right. And when, <laughs> when he retired, I did a full-page spread on him, mm. on all his accolades. And then the longer he coached, I realized that this has to stop. And I did a commentary on my show on Saturday, Sports Secondo style, where I called for his resignation. And then a week after that, I called for Joe Fontana's resignation because Joe thought he was uh, not only athletic director, but he thought he was the mayor of Southington and also the governor of Connecticut. <laughs> well, at that point, he had been around. And if, if for those of you who don't know who we're talking about, Joseph Fontana was uh, coach, athletic director, Southington native, uh, started coaching 1932. The Gray yeah. Fox. Yeah. And then uh, didn't retire until uh, the late 70s, but he was uh, uh, he was Teflon, really. It was, you know, let, let him do what he's going to do. So when you come along, and if I know you well enough, you really didn't necessarily want the answers to the uh, financials of Southington Plainfield. You were just looking to... Uh... <laughs> Now let's get let's get into the uh, the Jim Senich uh, uh, timeline. I mean, he worked here at WATR. Yep, he was he was everybody obviously loved the guy. He was able to work, I believe, with Ali Vestro in the sports department yeah. and Bob Sagendorf, and he was a great sports broadcaster. He, he did news for us. He did sports for us. He did, I thought, a really wonderful talk show or two for us. And he used to play music on Saturday morning. He did a Saturday morning show here, which uh, was great. And But before he, he was here, it was at NTY, at BIS. And I think in the 60s, he was uh, in Bridgeport, right? He worked in Bridgeport. Yes, yeah. uh, NAB, hmm. which uh, coincidentally was owned by Harold Thomas. Really? And I think there's a famous story uh, that we'll have to think about telling, uh, that Jim met Mr. Thomas, also the founder of WATR. I think Jim was a young broadcaster and he kept seeing this guy outside. Remember this story? <laughs> and it, uh, I, I remember bits and pieces of it, but he didn't realize until well after after that it was the owner of the station. But, yeah, he uh, I think the late 50s into the 60s, he was uh, in several places. But some of the audio that his son Eric has put on uh, YouTube is from his time at WNAB, which includes air checks of him as a DJ, as a news person. Uh, doing commercials, it, it, all in one shift. He did everything. Yeah. Uh, so let me see if I can find one of those so we can uh, – let me play that. The uh, I have a very funny Jim Senich uh, story for you when you're done. All right. This is uh, – about, about those days. This is brief. It's only 20 seconds. 
At 8.30, WNAB headlines the news. This edition brought to you on behalf of the American Cancer Society. <laughs> President Kennedy has given approval for resumption of U.S. atmospheric nuclear testing. Detonations could come as soon as tomorrow. Back to 1962. It's just great to hear him doing a newscast with President Kennedy. 1025 here, it's WATR, 1320 AM, 97.7 FM. It's Talk of the Town on a Monday. The best of Talk of the Town with Steve Knoxon for the 11 and 12 o'clock hours today. Steve taking a few days off. He'll be back on Thursday. Why don't you tell your story, and then we're going to go to the phone. We have a very special guest. I hope this doesn't shock our very special guest, but <laughs> Jim Senich had, had us cracking up once years ago about his days at NAB when uh, they had a storefront studio for a while. And he was uh, doing a late shift or something, right? And uh, uh, he, <laughs> it was all reel-to-reel back in the day, a lot of huge reel-to-reel uh, programs. He had to change the tape. And he was in the men's room, and he, was, and he heard the, the, the station go off. So he came running out to, to do his job, I, but he came running out so fast he didn't quite pull up his pants all the way. <laughs> And see, he looks out, and there's these ladies looking. It was a storefront. Oh, my God. <laughs> he said, there's these ladies looking at him through the window. He, he never expected him to be there. He, it was hysterical. He was so embarrassed. But he, he just had to get to that tape, so he ran, probably, probably, <laughs> probably adjusting everything while he went. And then he got caught in the window by the ladies who were looking in, by the fans. They were, maybe they were better fans after that. Yeah. You know? Possibly. That's right. Uh, and and uh, Jim also tells the story that happened 13 more times. Uh, <laughs> But I, 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 and I said this to you, I've said it to you all week and a ton of times. I don't know how you guys did it back in the day with reels and carts and records. And you, you needed to have eight hands for one shift. And now, literally, it's just a couple of buttons yeah. and maybe the CD player. Yeah. But, but, I mean, you had to master so many things. And you needed an FCC license to be on the air. You had to have you? an FCC yeah. license, yeah. Right. So You do a good job, Chris, for somebody I never thought would ever be. Behind a microphone. Well, thanks. A good, a good job. Thank you. That he means does. a lot. He's All right. my discovery, too. Uh, we have... That's true. That's true. I was emceeing the Apple Harvest Festival dance. Wow. And you said, you have a great voice. And I said, yeah, but what am I going to do with it? Because I remember seeing a board like this and thinking it was like being in a cockpit. And I, I was scared of all the buttons, so I never pursued it, so... Uh, we have uh, Marty Senich on the phone. Good. Jim's son. So let's uh, pop in and say hello as uh, we remember the late, great Jim Senich, WATR radio personality and a great newspaper man of uh, 40, 45 years. And uh, let's say good morning Yeah, he to did Marty. all that, newspaper and sports and broadcasting. Yeah. And Marty, Marty Senich. Tom, is that you? It's me uh, along with Chris <laughs> Fortier and uh, Art Secundo. Outstanding. I hear Art's voice there. His buddy, uh, he, he's, he's his partner for so many years in so many different ways. That's right. Um, you know, you know, he loved you guys. There's no question about it. Uh, I, and we're my wife June and are sitting high listening. Um, you know, and it, it's so accurate to say that he he literally uh, brought everything to life to a higher place. And like you say, he treated everybody uh, the same way. It, it really was amazing. I think that's one of the legacies you know, that he left for us as a family. Um, you, you, you treat people that way with respect in life, and, and good things come back to you. Um, and it is amazing to hear uh, those, those comments, and people say so many great things about him. It's, uh, it certainly is comforting uh, over the last several days. It certainly uh, is, I'm sure. Well, you, first of all, you, I'm going to call you kids, but you, you kids <laughs> that are his, his kids, gr- such great personalities and such warmth, uh, amongst each of you, and it's it's remarkable to see that and to see your spirit. And it's all, we always love when we run into you guys uh, or and your sister uh, at different locations. Always great, great warmth, great humor and personality, which I'm sure you got from your parents for sure. Yeah, no doubt about it, Tom. You know, and as I said to you when we spoke last uh, the other day, you know, we 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 made the most of every opportunity. Um, and you know, my my brother Chad, my brother Eric, and I, of course. Uh, were there, but my sister, Diana, um, you know, Valentine the Clown, was unbelievable in the things that she did for him to, to you know, preserve the great parts of his life through, through difficult times in the last several years. Um, you know, and he was in incredible care uh, at Southern Care Center. 
Uh, they did everything for him to to continue, you know, uh, keeping him comfortable and making uh, the times that he was there as positive as possible. But uh, my sister was just above and beyond incredible. And, you know, I, he did he did give us um, that positivity as my mom did, um, you know, and, and taught us. You know the things that you're supposed to do. I don't know that I always followed all those times. I might have been a rebel fan, but that's okay. <laughs> that's right. That's right. He, he, yeah, he he set the table for us uh, to be successful and opened doors just in so many different ways. Um, it, it, it was remarkable. Remarkable. Remember when you guys were little? I sometimes was at your house. And uh, oh, your dad right. and mom would get me a folding chair. And here, stay for dinner. Well, if I'm going to stay for dinner, I'm going to just just going I'm going to sit right down and enjoy it. Yeah, we had lots yeah, of good I, laughs. I hope, and I hope you forgive me. Remember, I got mad at you because you were holding my younger brother uh, Chad when you came over in those initial days when you knew him. And you know, he he's my brother. Don't you know, get your hands off him. And my dad's <laughs> like, easy. I forgot that part. <laughs> yeah, oh, wow. no. I forgot you were such a brat. Oh, good. Did that mean you, you forgave you? I forgave you. I must have forgiven you, yes. And, of we course, were a little. when your sister we was going to clown college, her dad called me and said, can you help? Yeah. She wants to be a clown. So I, I gave her some yeah. theatrical background. Well, obviously, she didn't need any of that. She's tremendous, and she just did. Uh, but I, I was happy to help out where I could. You got that right, Tom. And, you know, I, I know as a, uh, as a journalist that art was uh, and, is, uh, and is a radio voice, you know, my dad, he, he excelled. In fairness, you know, he, he was a fair writer. He was a fair reporter. You know, and most most importantly, uh, in today's media, you know, he, he, he frowned on negativity, and, and that that's that's a, a different different thing in our world today. And he just he wouldn't have it, you know. And I think, you know, most importantly, uh, he, he was fair to all of us kids. I, you know how he did it with with four of us, then later on with Mary Ellen, he, he gave all of us equal time. Um, at whatever radio station he was at, WGCH, WBIS, uh, ATR, all, all the way through the line. It, it's amazing how he did that with uh, with so many of us with so many different obligations to be different places. And as you know, he was the, the MC of all MC. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> uh, he, he did, you know, the Aquaturf uh, was basically his, his name should be on there. He, he did so many. And he was loyal, too, Tom. He was loyal to everyone. Uh, everything he did, he he prepared. You know, he he did his homework. He, he made sure he went in there and he knew what he was talking about, which is amazing. Theater that clip that Eric shared from uh, from so far back, yeah. he, you know, he he prepared. He didn't want to go in not knowing, um, and, and that was huge. And as both uh, you and, and Chris, you know, you you know as well. He he to me, I'm biased now, but he was the greatest storyteller of all time. People who had heard his stories so many times needed to hear them again and again. Yeah. And people who were close to him, you know, had to hear them, and he just captivated um, everyone's attention. And you know, he taught us to be respectful. Uh, he taught us to handle things with class, um, and, and that's not always easy to do. Well, I was saying earlier, some of these audio cuts that I've heard recent, in recent days remind me of how much uh, energy and uh, kindness he had on the air, and and uh, in yeah. interest in who he was speaking with. Interest and energy, yeah. and when he did our talk show, sometimes he would do like a Waterbury uh, thing where he, people would call in and talk about the old days of Waterbury, and the lines would get lit up, and he would so enjoy that because he was raised here. He was raised here, and you know, so he had all kinds yeah. of stories. Yeah. Oh God, he loves Waterbury. You know, and, and when we moved back, we moved in with him, uh, and, and just you know, for that brief period of time, you know, having people around us who, who knew who he was knew you know what kind of person he was it was just you always wanted to be there you just wanted to hear his voice you know and, and see you know things that he had done and uh he did it all from the heart and uh you know it's true he made you feel like you were the only person in the room when he talked to you or when he interviewed you uh and as you you know you mentioned on facebook i'll have to catch up on those because there were just hundreds of athletes and art knows this as well if you were senate's sports scope featured athlete you, you had the ring going, of the yeah. town for that week <laughs> <laughs> you were you were top dog and he did it for so many um referees umpires athletes uh all across the board was uh was was a gift and we try to take a little bit of that with us everywhere we go in our in our day-to-day lives marty thanks so much for joining us uh we have uh, uh your brother eric on the line who we're going to get to after we take a break uh, obviously, all of us here at ATR and uh, in the community, even those of us who never had an opportunity to work with your dad, but were hugely influenced um, 
Uh, it's uh, We know it's a huge loss for uh, you and your family, as it is for us. So uh, our condolences from everybody here at the radio station. And uh, I'm sure we'll see you soon, and uh, we will definitely keep in touch. Chris, Tom, we thank you from the bottom of our heart. This is uh, extremely meaningful, extremely meaningful. We appreciate this a lot. Thank you so much. Absolutely. You, you got it, guys. Be well. Take Be care. Well. All right. You, you too. Thanks for calling in. The great Marty Senich, 1035 at WATR, as we remember the late, great Jim Senich, who uh, died last week at the age of 83, longtime radio broadcaster and journalist in the area, never uh, never left Connecticut, stayed close to home, and uh, certainly uh, leaves a great legacy. We're going to take a quick break. This is Talk of the Town on WATR. We'll be right back. As your front page headlines at 8.30, this edition brought to you on behalf of the American Cancer Society. Jim Senate reporting for WNAB at 14.50 on your radio. Uh, that's nice to hear. <laughs> that goes way back, yeah. yeah. Now, his cousin, who became a big TV star, Bob Crane, and a big movie star at the time, was also in radio. Bob Crane was in radio. And he was, I think, in Bridgeport and then moved on to California where he became a big disc jockey and then broke into television and had some really big hit shows and also made a couple of Disney movies That's along right. the way, like Super Dad and things like that. And so he, Jim actually kind of resembled him. Yes, yes, he they did. They kind of liked, and their younger pictures, yes, they looked did. quite alike. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But Jim never really bragged about that to a point to make himself look better. <laughs> Jim was That's just right. Jim. That's right. I think from what I've read and even listening to, uh, there's a great, we talked about it this morning, there's a great uh, audio selection of a letter, a taped letter that Bob Crane sends home to Jim, who's feeling a little frustration and being able to find something solid in radio. And I think the reason he, I don't think he bragged art, uh, which is a good point. I think he had great pride in that relationship that he had with Bob Crane, mm. didn't want to take advantage of it, and really, truly wanted to know how he started right here, exactly where Jim is starting, and he got to California, and, you know, the rest is history. And the person who put all of that audio up on uh, YouTube and is uh, a great archivist of his dad's work and uh, followed in his footsteps is the great Eric Senich, who joins us on the phone. He's next up. There he is. Eric, Hi, good Eric. morning. Oh, good morning, guys. How are you? Very good. fine, thanks, Eric. Thank, thank you for joining us. You heard your brother uh, a few minutes ago, of course, Marty. And I know your sister, yep. uh, Diane, is listening uh, in uh, Colorado or wherever she is right now. Uh, so it's great to have you all with us. I know it's a difficult thing to lose a parent and uh, having lost, uh, obviously, my own over the years. And uh, we appreciate you guys being with us on the air during this, this tribute to your dad. But you have, as, as uh, Chris just said, archived so much of his work so it can be shared online. And I, I, that, that is a wonderful honor that you did for your dad, to have that. That was real important, real important to me. I hope you guys can hear me okay. Oh, yes, Absolutely. very well, yeah. Headset on here. i got the air conditioner on because it's quite hot. But, <laughs> yeah, I um, very important. Hi, Art. How you doing? Hello, Eric. Nice to hear from you. <laughs> is Art there? Art, I, I have some great memories, you know, of going to your Hall of Fame restaurant as a kid. So many memories, you know. But um, I remember coming here on Saturday morning. Your dad had a Saturday morning show, and you you guys would come with him, and uh, you'd be on the, yeah. in the newsroom floor on in sleeping bags, and uh, yeah. you you were his partner uh, when he did the Saturday morning show. Yeah, I think yeah, I think I stepped anyway, yeah. over you a few times. No, no did you? <laughs> That's probably why I'm so uh, you know a little nutty. <laughs> on my on my head. No, um, but th those tapes are super important because he. Th I, I think this was about ten years ago, and he he said uh, he called me. He said, Eric, I got some reel to reels that I want you to um, take, you know, and see what you can do with them because I was working in Danbury and they had a reel to reel machine. Uh, and I said, Yeah, what what do you got? And he just gave me this box of all these tapes and unfortunately like three-fourths of them were no good you know like i would put them on line them up and it just didn't sound good at all unfortunately mm. one of them was tom siever that was a bummer mm. but he had yeah he had um he had that what i think the first one i did was a ted williams one because that was by far his favorite interview favorite so i put that on and i lined and the tape was so brittle it was orange and it was really um you could just like if you bent it it would crack so i was like super careful yeah. lined it up ever so gently you know and hit play 
and there it was, like crystal clear. I was like, oh, yes. <laughs> you know, so I got it, and I saw the wavelengths on the computer, and it's going in. And it was like, you know, that's like that make or break moment. It's like either this is going to play through or it's not, and it played through. So I got that one in, and then there was the Phil Rizzuto one, same thing. That like, sounds yeah. great. That, that's a great interview. Oh, that's a great one. And um, the uh, rest in peace, Spec Shea, because Spec was the one who hooked up that interview with Ted, yeah. um, with Dad, and Spec was, uh, he was so cool. So then I, and then he, and then my dad said, I want you to, uh, I, I want you to have this, and it was Bob Crane's um, KNX anniversary album on vinyl, I said, wow, that's awesome. It's the first time I ever heard Bob on the radio. And, uh, and then he said, well, I got something else from Bob here. I said, he sent me a lot of tapes. You know, he, would, uh, he said I would write to him, and he was so good to me. And instead of writing to me, he would just go in the studio and record audio messages. So he handed me these things, and it was, and it was like, I'm holding these things. I'm like, I can't believe this. This is like audio of Bob, you know talking to my dad what's it gonna sound like you know so i put it in man and i was like i remember that day just putting in listening to it from beginning to end i was like wow this is so and then at the end you hear and bob's at the end he's saying you know best of luck on your upcoming wedding and that was with my mom wow, wow. you know so this is 63 and bob was still at knx he was trying i don't think he he didn't have the donna reed show yet he was struggling he wanted to get into radio i think he says it in there he's like everybody wants me to be an mc but man you know just to hear bob like just at one point he goes he goes but for god's sake jim don't give up don't give up that's the worst thing you could do you know and he was like so encouraging to my dad and my dad looked up to him a lot in fact that's that's what got him into radio he, bob and red barber and Art probably barber. know the Red wow. Barber. Yeah, yeah. yeah wow. He loved Red Barber. So that was the thing. He wanted to be a DJ or a sportscaster. You know, by listening to to both of them. But when he when he heard Bob on the radio, he he's like, I want to do that. I want to do that. You know. And so Bob would help him, and he would because he was ten years older than my dad. So um, you know, he he helped him so much. And I'm trying to think. There was well, God, the one you just played, the 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 one from. <laughs> uh, NAB in 63, the air check, which somebody was nice enough on YouTube to, to narrow it down based on the commercials. I think it was like April of 20, of April 20, April of 1963. Mm -hmm. And you hear my dad talking about JFK. Mm. It's like, oh man. It know? is great. So I, I, you know, yeah. And I, and I, I played it for my dad, but like I said, he was just like so humble and modest. He's just, you know, yeah, you know, he, he, just, he was, he wouldn't, he never bragged about it, so I, I, I'd be just like, "I'll do the bragging for you, Dad." <laughs> <laughs> I, I bragged about I it wherever I went, even at the nursing home. I'm like, "See that picture up there? That's my dad. That's when he's in radio, and that's Bob Crane. That's his cousin." And then you see this here, you know, and I'm showing on the Observer, and again, and see he's a, he's. If you go to Rencher Field, he's in the he's in the Southern, he's in the Connecticut Sports Hall of Fame. I didn't care. I was just like, <laughs> "Yeah, absolutely." I him everywhere I went. Absolutely, I didn't care. You know, and, and, but I learned from him that same modesty, like, you know, anybody kind of like, you know, if somebody came to me and he would compliment me, I'm like, oh, cool, thanks, thanks. But, you know, but it was like vice versa. <laughs> he was so proud of all his kids, so he would love talking about all of his kids, you know. Now, Eric, like you, said, you, you know? were in uh, radio too, right? You followed, oh, yeah. you followed long, Dad's long. footsteps, yeah. Mm -hmm. a, a, you, I mean, everything he did, I would do. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was never like he... It was never like he was like, you know, do you want to do this? Or, you know, you really should do this. It was just like, yeah, I saw him do it, and I, and I would do it. Like, he was like, you know, he was like the first rock star for me. You know? and I, I, <laughs> hey, our, you know, as a dad. You know, oh, listen to rock and roll and all that. You, you know, can't get a better compliment than that. That's a no, little, You really can't get it. He was the guy. Right. And we used to go, you know, I, I would go to him, at, to, you know, with him to the radio station. But then also, like, we, he'd take me out every Thursday for dinner. We'd go out to a restaurant. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. And pretty much every week there'd be somebody, Jim, how you doing? You know, and there I was like, you know, seven, eight, nine years old. I'm like, oh my god, yeah. you know, that is the coolest. How you doing? <laughs> you know, and my dad would be like, this is Coach So and So, and da, 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 da. and then Mr. Senich, how you doing? Oh my god, it's great to see you, uh, Eric. This is um, So and So. He's the uh, center fielder for the, the Blue Knights. You know, and I was like, yeah, man, my dad's the coolest. <laughs> you know, he, he was. 
You know, and, he, and uh, he, <laughs> he did so many things in his life, and you're right, he met so yeah. many people, and, and he, uh, sports dudes and, and uh, radio aficionados and uh, music. I mean, he loved everything. He, was, he just loved everything he did. Yeah, we, we can talk about everything. That's the thing. I mean, he, he had a bond with all of his kids, so it was all different bonds. You know, for me, it was like, you know, we could just talk endlessly about radio, sports, right? Like he, he would te- I became a sports writer because of him. I got into radio because of him. And I still, to this day, like I still write for music websites, and I, and I, and I uh, still broadcast. I have a podcast that I do, and I do interviews. And, and everything that I do is just like I think of what he would do. And he used to say to me, you know, that lead, Make that lead good. Make that lead good. You want people to, you know, to keep reading, you know. And I, to this day, I think about that. Mm. Um, you know, and then sometimes it's just when I hear myself talking, I'm like, man, that's dad, you know. And, uh, yeah, he, we, we just had a – and then we, when he, we both worked in Hartford together uh, towards the end. And so those car rides – and that was like the second chance because – you know, he when he had that accident, and I'm not sure how I don't I don't know what listeners know and don't know, but I I don't mind. I mean, he was hit by the car, he crossed the street, and that was '04, July 3rd of '04, and that from that point on was you know struggle. But he he kept working, and I I moved in below him in Waterbury, so or above him. I'm sorry, I was on the third floor, he was on the second, and man, he struggled to get in, you know in and out of that place, and he got into work every day. Yeah, and and I remember like we we would drive. You know, to and from those are like the best. Those are the best. And he, you know, we, we'd we'd uh, we'd hit Queen Street, heading towards Hartford, and we'd pass my sister Di's house, and he would say, "Hi, Di." <laughs> <laughs> He's like, just love his kids. Little things in life he loved too. You know, like the there'd always be these these birds perched on this wire. He's like, there they are, you know, or this cross guard that would be funny. You know, we just laugh at this cross guard in Hartford. That oh, there he is, <laughs> and you know, all these little things that he just enjoyed about about life so those t- but we would talk about radio sports music and he got me into all of the music that he loved as i got older i, I just had such an appreciation for uh you know the glenn miller and, and sinatra and martin d martin and then I, I played for him i know he got into pink floyd because of marty because he, <laughs> he, went to, he went to pick he went to pick marty up at, at bentley college and and um pink floyd was on and he was like who is this you know he loved that and but then i played grateful dead for him tom Grateful Dead. <laughs> How do you like that? <laughs> I, I said, just, just give it a listen, because I said, I'm going to tell you. Jerry Garcia, his, his roots are in a lot of the stuff you love. He's like, all right, let's get You know, he was always open to it. He's like, wow, this is good. <laughs> <laughs> so I turned him into a deadhead. But, um, oh, my God, so many memories. And you know what's funny, Tom, the asparagus story? The Jim Senate asparagus place, yes. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. So I, I, Do you have that so somewhere? Dad, well, no, but here's the wild. <laughs> here, this is wild. So I go, and I'm sorry, I don't want to keep. You know, I know you probably have other people want to call him, but I, I just have I got zillion stories. <laughs> but anyway, I, I used to, lo- I, and I still do. I go to movies just to get away. I love going to movies. So I, you know, he he would, I drop him off every Tuesday night. Drop him off after working hard. Go any movies tonight? I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. So I'd go down to that movie theater down near the 76 truck stop. It's still there. It's oh, yeah. the uh, AMC now. But, and they had a staff there, and I don't know how. They found out who I was. Like they, they said, "Are you in radio?" Uh, yeah, you know, I was just doing part time. I was like, "Yeah, I work in Danbury." He goes, and then this guy goes, "Is your father Jim?" Yes, yeah, he is. You know, and I'm thinking, okay, he's gonna, he, he's gonna mention ATR or CL. He goes, "I listened to it when I was a kid. My dad and I listened to your dad when he was on NTY." I was like, "Get out!" And he goes, "Do you remember the asparagus?" <laughs> what was it? The asparagus? What was it called again? The asparagus restaurant? I don't, what was it? It was asparagus something. He the said. Jim Senex asparagus place. <laughs> right. He goes, do you remember the asparagus place? I go, no. So I, I went and saw my dad the following weekend. I visited him that weekend, and, I, and he goes, oh, yeah. He goes, I remember. <laughs> it was so cool. I was like, that was like the first time, you know, because NTY was going back away. So usually yeah. it was a Waterbury connection. And the other one, I'll just real quickly, and then I'll, I'll, I'll shut up because <laughs> I can go on forever about my dad. <laughs> Rob Dibble, Rob Dibble, I went for an interview at ESPN, and Rob was in the studio with Dan Patrick doing the radio show. And so when you do an interview there, they're going to do the standard, you know, let me just show you around. Mm-hmm. So he said, this is Bob Lee. Hi, Bob. You know, this is uh, 
he introduced me to um, uh, the, the the one who's now doing Monday Night Football and all you know all these big names and and he's like uh, and here oh this is Dan Patrick and Rob Dibble I, I know Rob you know I said I don't know if he knows me but I sure know him because you know he knows my dad Rob just cuts me off he goes Dan uh, he turns to Dan Patrick who's like you know <laughs> national radio guy he goes this guy's father was the best sports writer. This guy. And he, w- he went on and on. And Dan Patrick was looking at him like, really? You know? And I, yeah. that was like, you know, like part of me was like, you know, emotionally it was like, I loved hearing it. And, the, and again, the other part of me was like, damn right. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, you, you know, that's, yeah, I know that's Dan Patrick there, but my dad, you know, that's, that's my right. dad. That's awesome. You know? That's fantastic. Well, Eric, you so, do you do have a million stories, so what you should do is hang on to most of them, and maybe we can do this again yeah. sometime. Yeah, that's right. That would absolutely. be great. So as we Thanks told, so much for doing absolutely that. as we as we told Marty, you know, you, uh, our our heart is with uh, you guys as you deal with the next few days, and just know that uh, we're going to do our part here to honor your dad's legacy moving forward. And uh, it meant the world to have you on with us today. Thank you. You know, I I wasn't sure I was going to get through it, but um, you, you did. talked about the good times, and that's what that's right. you know. That's what matters. So. Absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. All right. Yeah, yeah, thanks for as, as, a, as a father myself, I think it's so special that you, you took all this work of, of your dad's and put it up so people can have it forever. That's, you know, once oh, you're yeah. digital, you're good forever. So that's a <laughs> yeah, wonderful thing you've done. I can promise it's, uh, you know, I'm not done. Yeah, I'm that's, not that's done. Right. There'll be something. So, Eric, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find a whole bunch of old tapes, and I'm going to send you my old tapes. And oh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Send them away. <laughs> okay, great. Send them over. All right. Sounds <laughs> great. Eric Senich, thanks so All much right. for joining us today. Thank you. All, All right. You got Thank it. You. 1054 WATR. It is Talk of the Town on a Monday as we honor the late, great Jim Senich. As we take a break, I wanted to play this, uh, 1997. This, of course, is from uh, the archive that Eric has put together. It's Jim's interview, uh, uh, the beginning of Jim's interview with Ted Williams. Frank Speck Shea, of course, major league pitcher from Naugatuck in the 1940s and 50s. And the best part of this, they talk about sports. Jim gets very specific about certain players, and he's over the moon that he's able to interview Ted Williams. But the best part of this is the opening because it's so unpolished the way that Ted Williams gets on the phone, but it's funny, but brilliant. So as we take a break, 1055 here at WATR, back to 1997, uh, Jim Senich and uh, Speck Shea in the studio waiting to get on the line with Ted Williams. Take me out to the ball game. And Francis Albert Sinatra in the background singing appropriately enough, take me out to the ball game, because we have Ted Williams and Frank Speck Shea on this hour of the show. The interview with Ted Williams was set up by a good friend, Jimmy O'Loughlin, who was a police officer in Waterbury for many years. And uh, Jimmy and I became friends, and he has said to me over the years, someday I'm going to get Ted Williams on for you, and today's the day. So we've got Jimmy down in Florida who will take care of the intro. James, my friend, I can't thank you enough. My pleasure, Jim. My pleasure indeed. Uh... I'm here with the greatest hitter baseball has ever seen or ever will see. <laughs> you hear him? <laughs> you hear him in the back? Of the okay, I'm going to turn him over to you. Here he is. Okay. Ted Williams. Take it away. Okay. Hey, Ted. Right. Hello. Hey, Ted. Jim Senich. Jim Senich. Yes, how are you, buddy? Are you in, uh, in, in Connecticut? We're in Waterbury, Connecticut, and we've got Frank Specchia. In the studio with us. Oh, boy. How is he? Well, he's right here. Say he's, hello. He's very good. And how are you? I'm pretty good. And I'm with my dear friend, Jim O'Loughlin. This is Chris Fortier, WATR News. And for the next half hour or so, navigating you through talk of the town on this Monday. Steve Noxon has a few more days off. He will be back behind this very microphone Thursday morning. What we're going to do for the next 35 Minutes or so is continue our remembrance of the late, great Jim Senich, radio broadcaster, WATR legend, newspaper man, um, and had a great damn time doing all of it. So uh, Art Secondo still with me here, a Southington journalist, uh, former president of the Greater Southington Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Art's been around a long time, newspaper man himself, and uh, did some radio work with Jim Senich in the early days of the old WNTY in Southington. And uh, we have two folks on the phone that have waited a long time. So, Art, let's do this. Let's let's go to the one who's been waiting the longest. And uh, we know both of them. 
the great Karen Evitable, former uh, editor of the Southington Observer, where Jim was the longest serving editor in the newspaper's history from 1980 to 1988. And Art is laughing because to be the longest serving editor for eight years in the 1980s is a huge accomplishment. And uh, But Karen goes back even further with Jim. And uh, she's going to tell us that right now. Good morning, Karen Evitable. How are you? Hi, Chris and the company. How are you? Good, good. Great to have you with us. Good. Art Sicando here with me. Hello, Karen. Yes. Hi, Art. So you you got into journalism very young, very early, and uh, ended up being the editor of The Observer in addition to other publications. Right now you're at the Catholic Transcript. You, you knew Jim early, early on as you were still uh, getting your feet wet. Well, I sure did. Uh, so I knew um, Jim's children, um, just going to school with them, and I was always interested in writing. So one day, I was in junior high school, as we called it back then, and Chris, you can, I'm sure, relate to this, how hard it was to get a break mm. in the writing field. Sure. And I uh, called up because I knew that uh, Jim worked at the Observer, and I called up and said, can I come in and just talk with you? <laughs> and I did, and that was certainly at a time, as you know, when Kenny DeMauro was there as well. And uh, I sat down and I said, I just want to be able to try to write. And um, they, Kenny and Jim were very in favor of encouraging a youth correspondent so they said, well, why don't we just try you out on a couple of stories? So I said, um, okay. So again, I'm in junior high school, and I get assigned some couple of stories. And the, the first story that I did made the, the cover of The Observer, and that was the only Miss Southington um, candidate who went on to uh, win the Miss Connecticut pageant and um of course you know you're in junior high and you're you're thrilled and that were that was back in the days when you would basically uh i think i had a typewriter so i probably typed the story out and then i would go drop it off at the observer and stop in and talk with jim and then he'd give it to kenny to type up <laughs> so that was back in the day when <laughs> you didn't have uh, computers to send it electronically yeah it was like a four step process back then oh yeah, yeah <laughs> and um yeah, you know so i always so my mom would drop me off at the observer and i would just kind of make the rounds with the reporters who were there at the time and always stop in to say hello to jim and, you know, people certainly um, in later life remember Jim at, at the radio station. But um, Jim was a solid newspaper man. And he knew how to take a story, how to go after it, who the contacts were. And he did it in a really calm and patient manner, um, which was a real great learning process. And when you're a kid trying to break into this field and it's it's obviously dominated by adults and you had an editor who was giving you a chance to um, show what you got and to be patient about it and to be encouraging and supportive about it made the whole difference from my in from my high school career continuing to do stories for the observer and then through college and uh, into my professional life. So if I had someone back then who was negative, who didn't want to give me a chance, and who um, wasn't at all um, upbeat about the, his current job, which Jim was, um, it, would have, it would have been a totally different story for me and where I, I have been now professionally my my whole career in this field um and so it made the a huge difference and then to go back in 1996 and become the editor of the observer and that was at a time when art was there as well um was just life changing back then in this field it, because it was hard to break into it uh when you were a junior high school student 
and to really get the support and someone who was just lending a helping hand for a student back then. So I owe Jim Senage and uh, the late and great Kenny DeMauro um, all of the credit for taking me under their wing and molding me into what I've been my whole life, which has been a uh, reporter. I also um, contribute to the Hartford Current, which I've been doing for five years. So um, it, 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 was, uh, it was really Jim who let me have the break to do this. Well, and, and you couldn't have spoken truer words that if you had ended up with someone who, whose personality was a little more off-putting or you were more intimidated, you would have figured out what Plan B was. And it was the same thing with me. You and I kind of took the same path. I probably a little bit later, I was already in my early 20s by the time I uh, actually passed along some things I had written to Mr. Secondo. And uh, I was off and running at The Observer. And then to work there full time and then to become the editor you, you know, every once in a while, you sat back and went, wow, I'm here. Like, wow, how did what? <laughs> so it was it was a, a, a great path. And I got to tell you the other thing. I still can't get used to hearing the late, great Kenny DeMauro remembering, because uh, Ken would have loved to have been a part of this conversation to remember Jim Senich. And, uh, you know, it's one of those moments where you remember he's no longer with us. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And I'm sure members of the Urillo family who own the Observer would certainly have wonderful things to say about Jim as well um, as Mr. Anthony Urillo. And um, it, it, it was back then to get a position in a weekly newspaper was a big deal because there weren't that many of them. And uh, Jim really should be credited for everything that he brought to the table. It was, I, I always have a funny story that You'd walk into his office, and back then, you know, the newspapers were broadsheets, and there were just the piles and piles of um, observers that were on his desk, and also at that point, many of them had been, you know, bound into, you know, big booklets, and uh, he was a true newspaper man when you walked in, and was typical with just piles of the newspapers and everything all over his his desk and uh it was very much a, a an inspiration to me and my career and um it, it it's a it's a big loss to the whole industry as well well absolutely and a uh, great way to summarize it karen evitable veteran journalist in the region uh, thank you so much for sharing your memories and a great perspective uh as we remember the late great jim senich Thanks, Chris, and thanks for doing all of this for him. Absolutely. I'm sure he'd appreciate it. Well, and, and Take care. Always appreciated him. Thank you for taking the time. Take care. Thanks. All right. Uh, uh, let's take a very brief break. Dave, don't go anywhere. I see you sitting there on the phone. Somebody that uh, Art and I both worked with, a uh, longtime sports yeah. journalist. But uh, we're going to take a quick break. As we come back from the break, let's head back to a documentary that was made in 1999, I believe, on the history of Southington High School football. Jim Senich tells the story of one of the first times, or maybe the first time, that he met legendary coach and athletic director Joe Fontana, and it was a, uh, a meeting to remember. The first guy I met was Joe Fontana. He called me up, took me out to lunch, and he delivered about a seven-hour lecture on Southington High School football. And he invited me to his office the next day, and I went down to his office. And Joe said to me, let me tell you about a play that won a big game back in 1930-whatever, 33, 34, I don't know what it was. So he's moving boxes out in the hallway. He said, this is the offensive line. This is the offensive line. He said, now you're going to be the running back, and I'm going to be the quarterback. And he said, but we need a blocking back. Now, a secretary was walking down the hallway, and he grabbed her. He said, you got to be our blocking back. And she screamed. She didn't know what Joe was talking about. So she pulled her over, put him in front of me, said, I'm going to hand you the ball, and this is how we ran the play. <laughs> now, Art, you, you, you can picture that happening. Oh, yes. Yeah? <laughs> Joel Fontana was very animated. Yeah. He called him the Great Fox, and that's the way he was on the sidelines. And there's, there's many reports that when big students would walk down the hall, Joel would take a buddy arm and say, son, you go out for football? He goes, no, I don't want to play football. And Joe would intimate that the kid would graduate unless he played Southern High football. Wow. And let me add about Southern High football. A lot of people don't realize over 80 years 
of playing scholastic football with other towns, we've had only four losing seasons. You know, and we are the third winning is football schools in the state. I mean, that's why Jim Senich had a great time here. And another one who really enjoyed Southerton's history and was from Southerton, and a lot of us has forgotten, Dick Galliott, who lived on Eden Avenue near Liberty Street. And Dick Galliott was on the 1949 undefeated Lewis High School team and became a sportscaster in Channel 8 and worked at ESPN and, and passed away not too long ago, Dick Galliott from Southerton. That voice you're listening to is the great Art Secondo, Southington sports historian, civic leader, former president of the Chamber of Commerce, member of the Southington Town Council. Uh, most importantly, though, journalist going back uh, a long time, the old Southington News, and then uh, became active with the Southington Observer when uh, Jim Senich moved from radio back into journalism in 1975, the first sports editor of the Southington Observer, which was a new weekly newspaper that the Urillo family started and uh, survived until uh, COVID killed it. In uh, 2020, they stopped uh, production on The Observer. It was a great weekly newspaper. Mr. Secondo, at one point, the editor-in-chief. And Jim Senich, the longest-serving editor of the paper, 1980 to 1988. And the first sports editor, 1975. So uh, he's the one that uh, set the standard. And another one, another great sports editor from uh, the late 90s, is on the phone with us right now, a Waterbury guy, Mr. Dave Phillips, who uh, has a lot of memories, and uh, over the weekend called Jim his favorite journalist of, uh, 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 I think, of all time. We'll have to check. Mr. Dave Phillips, haven't talked to you forever. How are you? Great, Chris. How you doing, Art? I haven't talked to you in a while either. How's it going? Not too bad, not too bad. I'm really not a Waterbury guy. I actually grew up in Stanford Park until I was about nine, and you guys were talking about Bob Crane and Jim earlier. My father, who's now 96 years old, went to high school at Stanford High School with Bob Crane. So it, so wow. you never know. So you never know how that works out. Well, when I when I said Waterbury guy, when you and I worked together, you lived here, so that counts. Okay. Yeah. Okay, See? That works. I, actually, I, actually spent, I actually spent most of my childhood in Stratford. All right. Fine. You want to get technical. All right. So over the yeah. weekend, you, you you had great things to say about Jim Senich. You were uh, upset to hear about his passing, but uh, uh, very quickly wanted to pay tribute to him uh, over the weekend. So tell us what you remember about uh, Jim Senich, broadcasting journalism. Uh, you know what really stuck with you? Well. Back in about 1990 is when I met Jim. I was working for the Waterbury uh, Republican American at the time. That was when they had both the morning and the afternoon papers. And I got sent out to do a high school basketball game. So I'm sitting there taking notes. And his sidekick who did the stats, Gordy Woods, comes down and goes, you're with the Waterbury paper. I go, yeah. He goes, well, you're Jim's halftime guest. (laughs) I said, really? He goes, Whoever we see that's from the Waterbury paper is Jim's halftime guest. So I probably was on there 20 times. Joe Irwin was on there a ton of times. Roger Cleveland, whoever was there at the time, was Jim's halftime guest. It was easy. We were right there. Sometimes he would get other people. And Art probably remembers Edmund Saunders, who played the great player who played for UConn's first national title team back in 99. He was most of the time Jim's post-game guest because Edmund would score 30 points, get about 20 rebounds, and he would be the star of the game every time. So Jim Jim always had his guests lined up before, and he would talk, he would shoot the breeze. Half the time we would have nothing to do with the basketball game that we were watching anyway. (laughs) But Jim is one one of my all-time favorites. About six years later, After I met him, I don't know if you remember the Sports Page magazine. Yeah, sure. That that, uh, Andy Mashad started. Jim and I did a lot of the writing. We'd spend time in his living in his living room or dining room, figuring out where the where stuff would go in the pages. And back then, it was still you know typeset. Computers really hadn't gotten into it. His daughter, Mary Ellen, was like nine years old and would be looking at what we were doing, having no idea. (laughs) Ellen would read our copy to make sure we didn't make any mistakes. So it was was, was kind of fun. I enjoyed enjoyed Jim because he was just your neighbor that you could just talk to, shoot the breeze, and 
it didn't have to be about sports. We talk about you know everything else that was going on, but then when we come back and we do and we do the sport, and he would talk about his beloved St. Louis Cardinals, <laughs> and I would talk about my Mets who were lousy at the time. Yeah, at, we at the just, time. We would, yeah. Yeah. At the time, yeah, yeah. they're pretty decent now, which I'm happy about. <laughs> and and then when I went to Southington, when Art hired me to work over at Southington, started doing news, then they moved me to sports. Jim was happy that I was doing that because he knew that he knew that the paper had somebody that they could trust to do it. And uh, <laughs> glad to see you're still modest. Dave, we really appreciate your remembrances. We have a couple of more calls we want to make sure we get to. Uh, it, uh, it was very important and very happy that you were uh, uh, able to join us because you do have that unique perspective having worked with Jim. And uh, it was great to hear your voice after all these years. So I know we'll keep in touch. Hey, great to talk to you guys. Have a great rest of your day. All right, you too. Thanks. Dave Phillips, veteran a sports journalist. It's 1131. You're listening to WATR. Uh, did I say talk of the town? I didn't just yet. We're going to take a quick break. It's Chris Fortier with you, along with uh, the great Art Secondo. It's 1135 on a Monday morning. Chris Fortier and Art Secondo with you, probably until the top of the hour. Steve Knoxon returns to TOTT on Thursday, taking a few extra days off. And uh, before we go to the phones, we are going to... Uh, Catch up with another Senate sibling, Diana Sheard. I wanted to do this first. This goes back to 1997. This is Jim Senich interviewing Phil Rizzuto. Phil Rizzuto was on his way into Waterbury to do an, an appearance for uh, a chamber event. And uh, in the middle of the conversation, Phil wants to make note of uh, somebody he remembers from his playing days. Of course, uh, Rizzuto, a shortstop for the Yankees in the 1940s and 50s. And he wants to remember Spec Shea. Hey, Jim, one, yep. one name I forgot now, he lives right close there, Norgatuck, Frank Spexia. Oh, sure, Norgatuck yeah. Nugget. Sure. Yeah, Norgatuck, but I mean, there, there was a guy who could really pitch it funny. I mean, he could keep, keep in stitches all day and all night. He was really a riot. I'll tell you, I, I did a couple of shows with him, and he is one of the great storytellers. Yes, he is. And, and, hey, he could handle that fungo bat, too, right? Oh, yeah. He could really whack that ball. Yep. He's a great guy. Another great interview, Jim Senich with Phil Rizzuto there back 25 years. And uh, thanks once again to uh, the great Eric Senich for archiving all of that. That can be found on YouTube. Just type in Jim Senich, Phil Rizzuto, Jim Senich. Uh, Jim Senich in general, there's a lot of audio that uh, Eric mentioned is in uh, his conversation. Let's go to the phones once again and uh, catch up. We're lucky. We weren't sure if we were going to be able to speak with her or not. But the great Diana Senich Sheard is on the phone with us. Good morning. Hello. Hola, hola from Colorado. How are you? Glad to have you with us as uh, we, we go overtime here honoring your dad as he deserves. You guys are the best. That's why. Oh. You are so amazing. I just want to say that, first of all, I'm in Colorado, and I'm walking a dog and my grandson, who is named partly after my dad right now, Maverick James. So we are um, here taking a little walk. I'm getting dragged by a dog, actually, um, in true clown fashion. But I do want to mention <laughs> that you both so kind to um, mark my dad's birthday this year with a parade, which was a ball and loud and fun and even though he was much quieter he sat there and just took it all in and was so pleased to see everybody so thank you for that well i'm glad we were able to do it and you know you took the ball and ran with it as we knew you were going to and just <laughs> made it uh so amazing in uh, your friend there valentine the clown that always takes over the show and it was just uh it, it was terrific everybody at the southington care center it, it was it was one of those magical moments where you had to stay it stop and stand and look around and there was people in what i think must have been the dining hall or a rec room or waving from the windows and people outside it's hard to remember but it was very cold that day in march you know we really can't wrap our Absolutely. minds around that right now as temperatures hit 100 but it uh it, it was a great day and uh, it was great to see your dad and there was also another resident who, uh, whose birthday was around the same time. So that was that was a lot of fun. I'm, I'm, uh, we had actually talked about maybe doing it again this upcoming March. But, uh, you know, of course, getting the news last week. You know, your dad was such a, an influence on so many of us. And, uh, and obviously on you to get into entertainment and to be as, uh, you know, outgoing as you are. How much of that was influenced by, you know, you growing up? 1,000%. My dad brought me 
to the Hartford Civic Center for my first audition for Ringling Brothers Clown School, and I actually was too young to be um, accepted, but they let me do the audition. And then the next year, when they came through, I joined the circus um, because I didn't want to wait anymore. And um, (laughs) they were a little shaky sending me off, my parents, Hmm. but I'm so glad that I did it because I learned a lot. But my father... 100% 100% taught us, just like Marty and Eric were saying, chivalry, you know, paying attention to people. They're the only person in the room, and I still try to do that today in my job. You know, every child's face I'm painting, every person's birthday that we're celebrating is the person in the room. You know, I remember you telling me a story at some point of the static of AM radio being the soundtrack of your life in the background. And, you know, did, did you... You knew what your dad did for a living. And, you know, Eric had said that it was so cool to be out with him, and he was always looked at as a celebrity. Like, did you guys know what he did and how important it was and what it meant to him that he had such a passion for it? Oh, absolutely. He taught us so much. Like, the most important thing, which I always pay attention to, especially with pilots on airplanes, that the microphone is supposed to be one hand distance from your face, okay? (laughs) You're not, like, all over the microphone. And... You know, I was wicked shy until a certain age, and I think my father had a lot of that inside of him. But when he turned it on, the shyness went away, and he just became, you know, this public person. He could get up and from a quiet location at a, like an event at a table, and they would say, Jim, can you just say a few words? Boom. He would get up and just nail it every time, and people would be laughing, and it just amazed all of us. It amazed all of us. Well, and he, and he, yeah. also, he also became a uh, uh, sought-after master of ceremonies for a long time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, he would do a blessing first. He was like part deacon, I think, and, and part comedian, and then roast you. And it was perfect <laughs> every time. <laughs> well, that's the way to do it. <laughs> yeah, people would say, can you get up and do a blessing? And he would give the most amazing blessings at my friend's weddings and, you know, uh, birthday parties before meals, and then... They'd say, can you say a few words? And he would just drop you. And it was perfect every time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it was, uh, it, I think you and I first connected when we knew that we wanted to give uh, your dad the Betty Crower Humanitarian Spirit Award because that, the, the first award we gave out after Betty died in 2016, it was the first one that she wasn't going to have a hand in helping us hand out. So we needed to figure out who we were going to give it to because in true Betty Crower fashion she already had a list of about 27 people who uh, should get the award and uh, that yeah. that first year after she left us I, your dad's name came to mind because i thought as a journalist as a broadcaster but also the just what he did at the core of what he did he wasn't just a writer he wasn't just a guy on the radio as a newspaper reporter as a columnist uh, i said in uh, facebook yesterday he made celebrities out of these student athletes from Little League until high school, and and it wasn't a job. I, you know, I can't imagine your dad sitting at a typewriter just pounding out a column every week that he did. Uh, you know, it was it was within him. It was such part of his spirit, and how that has stuck with people, as I said earlier. And uh, the, the fact that you guys were so receptive to that, and uh, I think it was one of the one of the first times I had actually spent some time with your dad, and you know, again. As I said in social media over the weekend, he had such an influence on me, but I never got to work with him. But that's how important, especially here at ATR, where we pay such uh, tribute to people who used to work here and the influence that they still have. And and that was your dad. So to be able to honor him and then to have you and your siblings join us that day in the summer of 2017 uh, is something that will always be with me. Oh, the pictures. I still have so many pictures. And the late, great Dave Austin, his friend who was a... uh, photographer for sports illustrated back in the day and he would take pictures every time we all worked together he took a bunch of pictures that day mm. and oh my gosh so many great memories well we're there's not going to be enough wall space you know at plainsville funeral home because there's so many fabulous memories in picture so we'll have them all up i'm glad you mentioned uh, dave austin dave was always good about calling us every year to make sure that we remembered to mention your dad's birthday on the air and uh, was was there taking the photos and made sure that he got copies to us and uh, was sad to hear that he had passed away. Actually, I think I heard it from you uh, earlier this yeah, year. I but, was uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know. You know, Speaking of birthdays, I, I always remember this. Um, my younger sister, Mary Ellen, it was her birthday. And 
he, dad was on the air that morning. So before school, he said, Mary, I'm going to call, and, and you can come on the radio. I'm going to wish you happy birthday. So she came to the phone, not really exactly knowing. And dad said, Mary, you're on the air. It's your birthday today. How do you feel? And she, she's so shy. She dropped the phone and ran away. <laughs> she ran <laughs> <to> another <laughs> Uh, I always remember how funny that was. <laughs> that's great. Great story. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we know you have some walking to do. Uh, so yes, we, we... I'm dragging, <laughs> being dragged by a dog. <laughs> uh, well, as we said to your brothers, you know, uh, our, our hearts are with you guys as you deal with the next uh, week or so. And just know that we're always here to honor your dad's legacy. And, um, you know, the, the, the courage that it took to come on the radio and honor your dad. Uh, even though I know it was important to you, it's a difficult thing to do. So I know that uh, speaking for Tom and the rest of the staff, uh, you know, we're here for any anything that uh, you guys need. And uh, we're with you. Always with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you a thousand times over. And we look forward to celebrating him August 7th. August 7th. Okay. Wanted to write that down because yeah. a few people have asked. All right. Yeah. D- Diana Sheard, thank you so much. And uh, be safe. You know, don't get dragged thank down. You. No. <laughs> No, I'll think of you as I'm flying through the air here. Yeah, it's terrific. Dog. All right, thanks so much. <laughs> Have a great day. You thanks. too. 1147 here at WATR. We are now joined once again by Mr. Tom Shoot. I just came oh. in. I was list- I was working in my office and listening to the continuation of this great tribute, and I want you guys to know, and the family of Jim to know, that the social media comments on our WATR Facebook page, et cetera, are just so kind mm. and so uh, warm. Uh, he obviously, when he was here, made a great presence and um, a great part of WHR's story. And it's so nice to see those. I just came in to say thanks to all those nice people who have been listening in and enjoying it, but also remembering the great, uh, the great the fun times we had with that, that very warm character, Jim Senich. Good. Well, I'm good. I'm looking forward to seeing those. It's 1148 at WATR, 1320 AM, 97.7 FM. We're going to take a quick break. Okay, so uh, Woolkit in that particular area, Fern Street, a tree coming down in the East Street area, Fern Street, and they've lost their power, and his, uh, what he has seen is a tree down and some wires on it. Don't go out if you don't have to. Tom and Jeannie will follow the news at 1 o'clock and keep you abreast of things. I'll be back later on. Jim Senate Chair, WATR Waterbury, 1320 AM. Thanks to Tom Brophy for being on the other side of the glass. It's 1 o'clock. Back to 1991 when Jim Senich, as a news anchor back in the day, would uh, stick around to do hurricane coverage. He would come in, yeah. as we have done in the past. That goes back to uh, Hurricane Bob, 1991. And it's Chris Fortier here at WATR, Talk of the Town, as we take a few more minutes to honor the late, great Jim Senich, who we lost last week at the age of 83, longtime broadcaster and journalist. I'm joined by Mr. Tom Shute, general manager, program director, morning show host, at W-A-T-R. Hearing Diana, yes. he- hearing Diana yeah. uh, on the radio, uh, who's so much fun, reminded me that when when she was mentioning her sister Mary, Mary, Mary Ellen, when Mary Ellen was little, uh, during storms, um, I would bring Courtney. I'd come into Waterbury sometimes overnight to stay at the Marriott Hotel or something, so I'd be in town for the storm, and so I would bring her because I knew there was no school, and you know we had a we, we had had an adventure, and so. She would come with me in the morning, and then Jim would bring Mary Ellen in the morning, and the two of them would supposedly be helping us, but they were like, you know, little kids. And they would <laughs> run around the, the desk in the, stu- the room behind us. They used to play at that desk. There's still stickers all over. The- they used to play office and school and all those things, and they had a ball. They, they loved the adventure, and there's still stickers all over that old desk. And out there. there's, there's stuff loaded in the desk, there's still little stuff. colorings yes, and drawings. That's and, all yeah, their yeah. stuff. They did that like 30, <laughs> well, 25 years ago. Wow. So hearing Diana mention her sister, I thought, you know, they used to come here and, and the, during storms and supposedly be helping us. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah, all of those, that, that's all uh, time-capsuled in that desk over there. Of course, you know, uh, Jim was uh, instrumental in promoting the gems, the Southington Semi-Pro football gems. I don't even know if you were born. This is back in 1970, 71. Larry Marsh, the former great quarterback of the Newington uh, football program, uh, was one of the owners, and uh, they formed in Southington here, and they needed radio, and yeah. Jim was uh, part of that also. That's one of those legendary yeah. things. To talk a second about uh, the the gems. Well, the Southington gems were... <laughs> well, back then, semi-pro, but their uniforms resembled the Green Bay Packers. Mm. We played at Southington High School's football field, which was on Main Street at the time, 
which is now Derenowski, and traveled all through New England at Fitchburg and Malden, Mass. And it was it was a, a competitive league. People kind of liked it. Uh, there were some guys from Southerton that you know were going to play in college and would make the team and Southerton Gems. Uh, they had banquets at the Poplar, and they made the news when they signed this former. Uh, pro player, I forgot his name now, but if they paid him a couple hundred dollars a game, that was big money back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, Southerton got on the got on the news with that semi pro team. You knew Jim both as a, a newspaper person, as a radio person. What do you think he liked doing better, or was it such a combination that it really wasn't that distinct that it just all kind of melded together? That's a you think good, he liked very, writing better? Whatever, that's a very I, good I, question. I, I think whatever made him feel good at the time. Jim would do anything if it was related to sports or, or even if it wasn't related to sports. People don't realize the guy was a, gay, a great con- conversationalist. Hmm. If you told him a story he enjoyed, he asked you questions about it. He didn't have it going one ear and out the other. And that's what we lack today when people talk to people. Sometimes you wonder, do people really hear what I'm saying? And <laughs> the truth is, it goes in one ear and out the other. You know, and my father used to say, when you listen to people, Take it in one ear, but the good stuff, let it stay, and the rest of the stuff, you can let it go out. <laughs> but don't let it all go out the other side. That was smart. So, Jim was a good man. A good man. I, w- I wanted to play this. This is only 22 seconds, but you and I, uh, Tom, you and I were watching a little bit of this retirement party for Jim Senich, 2001, that you guys gave for him when he was leaving to go. It, it was the last radio uh, gig that he had before he took a job at... Uh, communications director for the state supreme court just a second i, I wanted to tell you, i got oh, yeah. one i got one over jim at the time because i was such a rookie at that time with anti radio uh jim was like uh, my mentor but uh, he would let me bring in any guest i wanted so one saturday morning i brought in the national boulder geister champion <laughs> And uh, this was his name was Stan Roberts and uh, the what now the national yeah Boulder guys I mean I was honored to have the Boulder guys so we're yeah. in the studio and and I'm I I was oblivious to what kind of sport this was but this was a sport of uh, about twenty five state champions who uh, qualified to be in the Boulder uh, Geister competition, which was really rolling a boulder down a, a high mountain. And whoever rolled the boulder where it would... <laughs> <laughs> you can't even I do it a straight... <laughs> I really thought after the guy was talking for 10 minutes, that's what a stupid idea this was. <laughs> but, but believe it or not, the calls we got after the show were <laughs> phenomenal. And he was such a good, good guest. But to make a long story short, I, the biggest question was, what was the big thing you had to do to win this? Well, I had to find a boulder that didn't have any sharp edges <laughs> and that didn't go left and right and didn't hurt anybody when he went down. And I said, gee, I never heard of this. But, and I played along with it. The truth of the matter is, Jim called me right after the show that Saturday. He goes, what? That was great. I never knew about this. Where'd you get the guy? I said, I'll be honest with you, Jim. He just got hired. He's a part-time reporter at The Observer. <laughs> <laughs> this is We faked this one, but the guy fooled me, and uh, as I went along with it, it was good. We got a lot of calls. <laughs> he says, Art, right, you got me on this one. I just believed you right now, Art. <laughs> the Boulder guy's the champion. And in that moment, Art realized he could interview anybody about anything. Uh, he right. did. Uh, Chad Walker was one of them. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So 2001, this is audio courtesy of Johnny K because he had a video camera there at this event. It's only 22 seconds. but Is it's, this Jim's goodbye party? Yes, this yeah. is Jim getting up and uh, thanking you all. And uh, I just thought it was touching and a good way to uh, wrap up as we come close now. It's a bittersweet thing. I mean, I'm really getting a good job, uh, a really good job. And, and, and it's just a great opportunity and a great challenge. But I will miss you all. And, uh, we had great times together, and uh, it's not a goodbye. I'll still be around, but I won't be there every day. Thank you. I love you all. Thank you. Thank you. Now, he did stick around to do uh, play-by-play. Yeah. He was here for a while after. Yes, yes. This, is, okay. this is true. Yeah. Yes. All right. You got the <laughs> Just verifying. story correct. Yes. We are coming up at 12 o'clock, and uh, this has been a great tribute. Tom Shute, I can't thank you enough. Mr. Art Secondo, thank you for taking the two hours to join us. Uh, it meant everything to have you here, and it was great to uh, spend some time with you and stroll down memory lane as sad as it was. This is WATR 1320 AM, 97.7 FM in Waterbury, Connecticut. It's 12 o'clock.